Yo, how's it going, folks? Welcome to episode two in this series I'm calling the Great Medical Cannabis Con. Uh, while preparing for this episode, I realized the sheer volume of material that is involved in the subject and the areas that I said I would cover in uh, last week's video. So this week, we're basically just going to be covering uh, the historic medicinal use of cannabis here in the UK and how it became prohibited. And then we'll move on to the consequences of that in next week's episode uh, as well. So without further ado, let's get started by going right back in our history. Uh, most of you will be aware of obviously the British-Irish uh, physician, William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, who was first credited with uh, bringing sort of awareness of the medicinal consumption of cannabis from India to the UK during the uh, mid-1800s. However, as I now hopefully intend to prove, uh, that simply isn't true, really. Um, in order to fully cover the history of the medicinal use and the theoretical medicinal use of cannabis here in the UK, we're going to have to go back a long way to the prehistory of this little isle of ours. Um, I mean, there's already clear evidence of the early Britons cultivating cannabis here in the UK since around the year 343 BCE, that's before current era, uh, meaning that we had awareness of cannabis here in the UK, uh, or in what became modern day UK, long before uh, the Romans invaded a few centuries later. The Romans brought with them many things, likely as well cannabis. Uh, we do have archaeological evidence to show pollen and seeds from various places around central Italy, dating back to the culture that predated uh, the Roman Empire in Italy, the Etruscan, Etruscans, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but that did but it's back to the year around 3000 BCE. It's also known that the Romans had access to ancient Greek and Latin texts, which described um, the medicinal, entheogenic and intoxicating properties of cannabis. So we can at least uh, speculate that the Romans knew of what cannabis could do at the time that it ruled over Britannia. The scope of their empire was so vast that it absorbed, appropriated and co-opted many preceding and parallel cultures and religions, including the ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, Zoetraeans and the Scythians, all of which in some way had knowledge of the entheogenic and potential medicinal value. And benefit of cannabis. Prior to the invasion of the UK by the Romans, society is widely believed to have been sort of pre-Christian, pagan, practiced various forms of primitive polytheistic uh, religions centered around the worship of nature. For a couple of thousand years, once the um, sort of ancestral worship era ended, about 3,000 years BCE. Although little is known about these early pagans and early Britons, and their practices, we do know that cannabis was evident in other paganistic and polytheistic religions and theologies around the time. The practice of Druidry and the Celtic traditions were also practiced prior to the Roman invasion of the Isle, and they are well documented as having a knowledge of local plants and herbs and how to use them entheogenically and in ritualistic practice in their daily lives. However, these were later outlawed by the fourth Roman Emperor Claudius in the year 54, which would kind of explain uh, the suspicious absence of many of their records and uh, traditions, which are only, again, coming to light in sort of more latter centuries. Basically, what I'm saying here is that it is indeed likely that the Romans brought cannabis to the western part of its empire, including Britannia, and that the local populations already had a practice and extensive history and tradition of using uh, herbs and plants from the local environment in medicinal and entheogenic practices. So to me, it's quite highly likely that they would have also at least experimented, if not utilized, cannabis, regardless of its genus. The withdrawal of the Romans led to a period of time that is traditionally now known as the Dark Ages. Uh, there is little information about cannabis in the UK during this period. However, I feel pretty confident in speculating that I don't think they'll have taken it all with them when they left. Several centuries later, and the Vikings began sacking uh, northeastern and northern uh, shores of the UK and establishing settlements in regions such as Jorvik, which is the modern day York uh, in the 10th century, where we have evidence of seed and pollen from the cultivation and production of uh, cannabis in the region. Although there is currently no evidence to suggest that the Vikings used cannabis as a euphoriant or intoxicating drug, there is also growing evidence to suggest that Viking berserkers used a concoction of, amongst other things, psychotropic mushrooms and herbs before battle, making the association of Freya, the Norse, go Norse goddess of, amongst other things, love, battle and death, all the more curious, and in my eyes here, again, evidence towards the proclivity of the Vikings to consuming uh, different psychotropic compounds. 
in this sense, cannabis. After the Norman victory of 1066 and the famous Battle of Hastings we all learn about, most of the Viking settlements began to dry up and they left the shores. Again, as we said with the Romans, I think it's pretty safe to uh, speculate that they didn't take all that cannabis with them. Fast forward a few centuries into the reign of the Tudors, and cannabis had already become a well-established and highly prized crop. So well sought after was it that King Henry VIII, when he came to the throne, decreed that anybody that owned land over 60 acres had to dedicate at least one quarter of it to the cultivation of cannabis or forfeit at least half a year's wages. Later, when his daughter Elizabeth I took the throne, she increased the levies and the demand for the quota in order to serve the need for the sails, ropes and rigging of her ships in order to beat the Spanish Armada in 1588. At the time, cannabis was so highly valued and cultivated so widely that it started to compete for space with food. This ultimately led, arguably, to British colonialism, first starting in the Ulster region of what is now modern-day Ireland. A few years later, in 1597, the first recorded instance as cannabis as a therapeutic appeared in English academic literature when John Gerard wrote his book, The Herbal, quoting the Greek physician Dioscorus that he rec when recommending uh, cannabis for the ease of pain of earache and for the treatment of jaundice. Under the house that followed, the stewards, cannabis became an ever more vital naval and militaristic resource in the establishment of colonies overseas such as in Jamestown in North America, where the settlers were instructed to cultivate cannabis for the need of the empire. This would consequently lead to the gradual reduction of domestic production of cannabis over many decades and centuries as other empirical regions started to take up production. In 1653, Nicholas Culpepper repeated the recommendations of John Gerard in his book, adding that the roots of cannabis could also be used to allayeth inflammation, easeth the pain of gout, treat tumours, knots of joints, and pains of hips. A few years later in 1689, and the natural philosopher Robert Hooke presented his findings from a study on the effects of cannabis in India to the Royal Society of London. Interestingly as well, in 2001, uh, a South African anthropologist by the name of Francis Thackeray carried out an excavation of William Shakespeare's home in Stratford-upon-Avon, where he found several pipes and pipe fragments dating back to that era. After testing the pipes, he found some of them contained residues of nicotine, cocaine, and four of them contained traces for a compound that had a chemical signature similar to that of cannabis. While this is disputed that the Bard ever smoked these pipes, the date of the pipes is not contested, making the use of cannabis in this era all the more likely, if not even largely unknown or even documented at this time. In 1813, the British doctor, Whitmore Ainsley, published his accounts of cannabis usage in the Indian colonies, bringing awareness of smoking and the drinking of cannabis to the domestic population back home. During the Georgian era, cannabis slowly became ever more present and commonplace in the medical kits used by doctors of that era. It was also a period of alleged uh, exploration of the upper classes of the intoxicants of the empire, as it is believed that cannabis was enjoyed as an intoxicant along with many other drugs. However, it was during the Victorian era that the medicinal benefits of cannabis really began to go mainstream, with the work of the aforementioned William Brooke O'Shaughnessy and the publication of his book, uh, Bengal Dispensatory and Companion of the pharmacopoeia in 1842. This led to an explosion of the number of available medications, uh, concoctions and potions and remedies uh, that were all derived or featuring cannabis in Victorian Britain. It is well known of this area that Queen Victoria utilized an alcohol cannabis extract to treat menstrual pains and to deal with uh, pain in childbirth that was prescribed to her by her personal physician, Dr. J. Russell Reynolds, before he later got, went on to write an article for The Lancet praising the medicinal benefits of cannabis and advocating for its widespread use. Did you know that she also drank laudium, an opium tincture that she took every night to ease with her sleep, as well as reportedly being a fan of cocaine-laced chewing gum? In the latter half of the 19th century, a Scottish doctor by the name of Thomas Colston started using cannabis to treat insanity in a clinic that he worked at in Carlisle. So successful was his work with so-called hemp drugs at the time that he won the Fothergillian Gold Medal um, of the Medical Society of London in 1870. By the late 19th century, cannabis began to become entangled in the fear-mongering racism and faux religious moralizing around the consumption of opium and coca by non-white and lower classes in Britain and the British-occupied regions around the world. This primitive reefer madness was ramped up as a way to explain the rise in unrest and criminality within the British colonies, including British-controlled India at the time, where it was being reported that the lunatic asylums were full of ganja smokers. 
It was exactly this kind of hyperbole racist rhetoric and the British ruling elite's obsession with class codification and its civilizing mission around the world that heavily influenced the prohibiting of cannabis and consumption by the lower classes within its occupied territories. I'd also like to add that it is highly arguable that it is indeed this racist, classist, and I suppose, frankly, eugenic uh, pursuit of the categorization and civilizing of the inhabitants of the colonies that it occupied around the world that would ultimately lead to the demise of the empire. As this racist rhetoric continued, the British Parliament were ultimately forced into doing something, launching a commission into the effects of cannabis, or Indian hemp drugs as they termed it at the time, and the population of the Indian colony. The seven-member Indian Hemp Commission returned its findings, a 3,200-page report consisting of over 1,200 testimonials from across the socioeconomic, religious, racial, professional, and class spectrum of India making it the largest study of cannabis and its effect of its kind. In their conclusion, they stated that the moderate use of cannabis is practically attained by no evil results at all, and that the moderate use of cannabis appears to cause no appreciable physical injury and produces no injurious effects on the mind. Unfortunately, little was ever really done with this report, and it faded into obscurity, as throughout the Edwardian era, cannabis slipped from being a wonder drug to being a dangerous threat to the conservative white Christian sensibilities of the day. So just how did cannabis go from being a Victorian era wonder drug to being criminalized here in the UK? Well, in much the same way as many other colonizing European countries, it first started within our overseas territories, first starting with Mauritius in 1814, then in British Guiana in 1861, then the limiting of the sales of cannabis to licensed dealers in Sri Lanka in 1867, and then in 1870, in what we now call South Africa, the British passed the Cooley Law Conciliation, prohibiting the smoking use or possession by sale, barter and gift of cannabis to any coolies, which was a, a crude term for the time and racist term for Indian indentured workers. The very same year, the British occupied colony of Singapore prohibited cannabis. It was then prohibited in the British colonies of Jamaica in 1913. The East African Protectorate, or what we would now consider majority to be Kenya in 1914. Sierra Leone, 1920. And then ultimately in South Africa in 1921, where there was such a full moral panic and about the consumption of what is known locally as dagger in the colony that one justice official wrote, the evil effects are found principally to concern public health and crime, but agriculture is by no means unaffected since the effect upon farm laborers of the smoking of the herb greatly depreciates the quantity and the value of their labor they would otherwise be capable of rendering. In my opinion, a rather telling statement that lays bare ultimately the motivations behind the prohibiting of cannabis within the occupied regions and colonies. A few years later, and cannabis would be prohibited in the British-controlled Trinidad and Tobago in 1925, Indonesia in 1927, before finally succumbing themselves to the pressure that it is kind of created by proxy through its colonies and imperial neighbours to ratify the 1925 League of Nations Opium Convention, adding cannabis as an addendum to the British Dangerous Drugs Act of 1920. It is very much worth noting here that the request to add cannabis to the list of dangerous habit-forming drugs for the 1925 Opium Convention was expressed solely by the South African government in 1923 three years before it gained sovereignty via the formation of the Union of South Africa, very much, in my opinion, making it a British-controlled decision. Once on the chopping block, the pressure to pass the cannabis amendments to the 1925 Opium Conventions came predominantly from Italy, Egypt, and South Africa, the latter two who were still heavily influenced and deeply entangled with the British Empire at the time. Domestically, cannabis prohibition wasn't really enforced in the decades that followed the signing of this treaty. However, in 1950 in Soho, the raiding of Club 11 led to the arrest of several British-born middle-class white young men who were arrested for cannabis and cocaine possession, throwing out the societal assumption that it was only the lower classes and non-whites and deviants that did drugs. Over the ensuing decades, the awareness of cannabis would be greatly increased within the British zeitgeist and pop culture ultimately leading to a dramatic increase in arrests from 235 in 1960 to 4,683 by 1970, with the majority of these being predominantly young, white, and middle class with no previous convictions. However, there was a growing perception that drugs and drug culture were having a corrupting effect on the nation's youth, challenging long-held beliefs such as nationalism, patriotism, religious and social orthodoxy and dogma, and ultimately threatening conservative Christian values, this ultimately led to an increase in internal and international political pressure for tougher sentences on drugs and drug users. Ultimately, it wouldn't take long for the UK to succumb to pressure to ratify the 1961 UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, with a flurry of racist rhetoric, unscientific evidence, hysterical formalizing the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act was born.
So, in a nutshell, cannabis prohibition began here in the UK because of good old-fashioned religious hysteria, formalizing racism and classism. Oh, and don't forget economics. I mean, you can't spell prohibition without resource and capital restriction, commodity consolidation and market manipulation, can you? But that would need to be an entire other video. So, we survived. There you go, folks. Welcome to the end of part two of this series. Ultimately, now going to be extended because we needed to try and cover more ground, but... I didn't want to keep you here too long. You've got busy lives. So in next week's episode, we will take a look at cannabis prohibition, how this has impacted human health, uh, our environment and ecology, and what this has all got to do with the creation of these fucking highly profitable pharmaceutical cartels that we all know and love today. All right, folks, if you enjoyed this video, please do like, share, and subscribe. If you really enjoyed the video, check us out on patreon.com forward slash The Simple Life, where you can help keep the lights on on this little project of mine. The ones that are currently cooking me alive because it is warm today stay cool folks i will see you next week and oh yeah check out the podcast peace and challenging long-held beliefs such as nationalism potato potatoism still <laughs> uh, pains and to ease child's pain <laughs> okay take this shut the fuck up <laughs>